Let's talk about different forms of energy. There are several that you're familiar with. You've had a physics class or some other classes, and you're familiar with potential energy and kinetic energy. You even know how to convert between them. Say you have a bicycle or a car at the top of the hill, and it starts rolling down the hill. You know that the potential energy in that body is converted to kinetic energy. You can even quantify it, right? The amount of potential energy that the bike has, for example, or the car at the top of the hill, is mgh, the mass of the vehicle multiplied by the acceleration of gravity times its height. Of course, here we have Wiley E. Coyote learning his own gravity lessons, as he's, again, been fooled by Roadrunner. Uh, kinetic energy, you know, is one half mv squared. So if you know the mass of a vehicle moving, you know its velocity, then take half of the mass times the square of the velocity of the car, and you've got the kinetic energy of that, that body, that car. Now, if you stop and think about it, you might realize that the wheels are rotating as well, and since wheels have inertia, or a mass moment of inertia, those wheels also contain energy because they are not only translating forward, moving down the road, but they are rotating about an axis. And so that rotation includes some amount of energy. By comparison to the amount of energy in your car, okay, yeah, it's not much, but it's still there. And you may remember the equation for quantifying that as one-half I omega squared, where omega is the angular speed of the wheel in radians per second. Now, that probably will uh, make you think about radians and, and maybe you've wondered what a radian is and why it's dimensionless. Well, this is just a quick aside for you, but a radian is the angle that is made in a circle when the chord length, I'm sorry, pardon me, the arc length um, is equal to the radius of the circle. So you see the drawing here, there's sort of this pie section and the, you can see the radius R labeled on either side of the, the slice of pi, and then the uh, arc length is also equal to the radius. And that angle turns out to be about 57.29, and it goes on forever degrees. That's, that's what we call one radian. Now, if you draw this out and you start to do a little bit of math with it and think about the units uh, of length for both the arc length and the uh, radius, you'll realize why radians are actually dimensionless. Uh, but I'll let you think about that. So those are some examples of energy forms that you're probably familiar with. There are other energy forms you may not be as familiar with, but you probably have, well, you've definitely used uh, in your life up to this point. If you go to the fuel pump and you put some gasoline or diesel in your car, whatever you run on, you're using chemical energy. You're, you're buying chemical energy. When you go into the, the grocery store and you buy your groceries, you are purchasing chemical energy. That's basically what you're doing. And the chemical energy, what is that? Well, unfortunately, a lot of people like to think of this as potential energy. And that's, I don't really like that because having a background in chemical engineering, I understand that really what we're talking about is the difference in energy that molecules have before and after combustion. And so that, that difference, that change, when you say, I've got a molecule here, it's carbon with four hydrogens, that's just a, uh, a methane molecule. When that molecule is burned, of course, the carbon reacts with oxygen, the hydrogen reacts with oxygen. You form one molecule of carbon dioxide and two water molecules. Well, the two water molecules and the carbon dioxide molecule do not have as much energy inherently in their bonds as the methane uh, molecule had. And so when you burn that methane molecule, well then you, uh, there's a difference in the quantity of energy before and after the reaction and so uh, that difference has to go somewhere and it goes into thermal energy. Now what on earth is thermal energy? Well now we get to the core of our course. Thermal energy is a form of energy we are particularly interested in. And I want you to remember this. I'm going to say it several times. Thermal energy is the motion of molecules on the molecular scale. So if you think about the air in the room around you, you may put your hand out and say, well, the air doesn't feel like it's moving. Well, actually, yes, it is. You could take a pressure gauge and measure the pressure in the room, and unless the air was able to contact the sensor on the pressure gauge, the pressure gauge wouldn't measure or wouldn't register any pressure. So there is actually motion of the molecules, and that motion uh, is proven by the fact that there is pressure. So really pressure in the air around you is a byproduct of the thermal energy. Uh, it's kind of, remember we talked about temperature before and I showed you that bulb that you can use with the pressure gauge for measuring the behavior of gases. Remember I said that you, you end up with a straight line uh, on the pressure versus temperature graph. 
but at some point at low enough temperatures the gas begins to liquefy out and so you have to extrapolate the line. Guess what happens to the pressure gauge during that time? Well the pressure just drops like crazy because there are no gas molecules pushing on it. So once the uh, gas, whatever you happen to put into the bulb, all condenses out, well then those molecules are no longer contacting the pressure gauge and there's no pressure to be registered on the gauge. So um, thermal energy is a really important form of energy. As a matter of fact, that's the primary form of energy that we're interested in working with in thermodynamics. We're either going to try and use thermal energy to convert a portion of that thermal energy into work, that's what your car's engine does, or we will try to extract thermal energy and concentrate it in another place. You see, thermal energy is interesting. It likes to spread out. Okay, It naturally degrades in a sense. It naturally um, will spread out amongst other matter and so that's why when you take a think about a, a taking a hot uh, mass of metal and dropping it into a vat of water what happens the metal cools down what does that mean well even uh, I, I used the example of gases for thermal energy a, a moment ago but liquids and solids also have motion on the molecular scale now in a solid the atoms and molecules that make up the solid can't move near as much because they're bonded to nearby uh, 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 atoms or, or molecules in a metal, for example, would be atomic bonds. Uh, well, they're all atomic bonds, but the, it doesn't matter. There's some detail there that's not important. The, the important part is that even on in a uh, solid, on the microscopic scale, those atoms can vibrate in place. They can move back and forth a little bit without breaking their bonds, and, and they do. As a matter of fact, the higher the temperature of a solid uh, becomes the more motion there is on the molecular scale. The farther they're moving, the more they're, they're vibrating. So um, that's what thermal energy is, and that's what we're interested in. If you think about what your refrigerator does, a lot of people are very confused about how their refrigerators work. They think that their refrigerator or their air conditioner produces cold air. It does not. Actually, what an air conditioner does is it pumps thermal energy out of a space. So, for example, if I uh, say it's winter time, I've got a tile floor in my kitchen. If I walk in front of my refrigerator during the winter time, you know, the floor is generally cold, but right in front of the refrigerator, it's nice and warm. The reason for that is because the, the uh, heat pump system, which is basically just an air conditioner, is air conditioning in the indoors of the microwave. In other words, it's, uh, pardon me, of the refrigerator. In other words, what it's doing is it's pulling thermal energy out of the air inside of the refrigerator and depositing it into the kitchen air. And so that air flows over the floor and that's why the tiles get warm because it's, it's warm air. Actually feels kind of nice in the winter time. So that's what thermal energy is. It's the motion of molecules on the molecular scale. And it's, as I said, what we're particularly interested in. But let's try to quantify chemical energy. Notice I presented those two forms of energy, but I didn't try to quantify them like I did with the potential and kinetic energies. In chemical energy, the way you quantify the amount of chemical energy that a substance has is by burning it. That's basically what you do. You use what's called a bomb calorimeter. It doesn't mean that it explodes. All it means is that it's a pressure vessel. You put the fuel in, typically in a, I think it's a 100% pure oxygen environment, and you start the reaction where the fuel begins to combust. It burns. So here's our general chemical equation for burning of a fuel. Fuel plus oxygen goes to carbon dioxide plus water plus thermal energy because the carbon dioxide and the water have lower bond energies than the original fuel and oxygen had. So energy has to be conserved, so that energy goes somewhere. It goes into thermal energy, which is those molecules that remain, the carbon dioxide and the water, just bouncing around like crazy inside of the container. Now again, that's why it's called a bomb calorimeter, because the pressure goes up so much. And the reason the pressure goes up is because the carbon dioxide and water are moving so fast. Another piece of the bomb calorimeter that's interesting is you actually put this, this container, this pressure vessel, under a water bath, and the way you measure the amount of energy released is by the change in temperature of the water. But that's not too important right now. The point is we can quantify the amount of chemical energy in a fuel by burning it in a very controlled manner. Now, on the left, you'll see a combustion chamber where air is added on the left side and gasoline, for example, which is a fuel, is added on the right. And then that kilogram of gasoline that's added is combusted with enough air to complete the combustion. And the combustion products then come out the other side. Now, 
If we do that, you should know that you're going to generate thermal energy. In other words, the exiting uh, carbon dioxide, water, and nitrogen, because there is nitrogen in the air, will all be hot. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take that hot mixture of combustion products and extract energy from them until they cool down to 25 degrees Celsius, which I didn't mention, but was the starting temperature for this experiment. If you do that and you leave the water in the gas phase, you will have to extract 44,000 kilojoules per that kilogram of gasoline that was burned. That's how much energy is released. And that's called the lower heating value of the gasoline. The reason it's called the heating value is because it's the amount of thermal energy you get out. The reason it's called the lower heating value, if you think about it, makes sense. We're, remember that water is one of the byproducts of this reaction. That should not be a surprise. There's hydrogen in the original gasoline. There's carbon. The carbon reacts to become carbon dioxide. The hydrogen reacts to become water. Okay, it's reacting with oxygen. So uh, the reason it's the lower heating value is because we're leaving that water in the vapor stage. Okay, so or state, I should say rather than liquefying it out so that it becomes liquid water at 25 degrees, both of which are actually possible. So look on the right hand side and you see a, a slightly different experiment. We're putting the same things into the combustion chamber, burning them, and then taking the combustion products down to 25 degrees Celsius, but also in, intentionally uh, forcing the, the water to change phase from gas to liquid. If you do that, then you will extract what's called the higher heating value of that gasoline. It comes out to 47,300 kilojoules per that kilogram of gasoline that you put in and burned. Okay? Now, we're burning with just the right amount of air and assuming the, the reaction goes to completion and all those things. Um, but this is the higher heating value. No, you notice you get a little bit more energy out of it. And you might say, well, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense because I know that steam has more energy in it. I mean, if I take a pot of water and I put it on the stove, well, then I add energy to the liquid water and it turns into steam. Well, that's the point. That, you're exactly correct if that's what you thought because remember that water that's leaving the left side combustion chamber has extra energy since it's in the gas phase. doesn't mean it's hotter. It's at 25 degrees just like the liquid water is at 25 degrees in our second experiment. Okay, But that water has extra energy and if we extract that, that what's called the latent heat of vaporization of the water and move it from the gas phase into the liquid phase, well then we'll extract just a little bit more energy out of it. And so every fuel uh, that burns like this has what's called a lower heating value and higher heating value if it produces water. Some chemical reactions burn and don't produce wa water, but most do, and so uh, much of the time you'll talk about a lower and higher heating value of water. Now, where on earth would you ever see this? Well, there's a couple different examples. If you've ever gone down the road and you've noticed someone's tailpipe and you notice water coming in or liquid coming out of it, you might have thought, I wonder what that is. Is that gasoline that wasn't burned? What exactly is it? Well, it's, it's actually water. It's liquid water. You might wonder, well, how did that get in there? Did it somehow come from the atmosphere? You know that the atmosphere has water in it. Actually, that liquid water literally came from the gasoline. Okay? Now, it may have some impurities in it, but chemically, there's no different between, difference between that water and regular H2O. That's all it really is. Now, where did it come from? Well, think about it. As you turn on your engine and your car runs, there's a continuous stream of exhaust coming out the tailpipe. But that's a certain amount of mass within the tailpipe, right? Well, when you shut off the engine, what happens is that that exhaust is no longer being pushed out the back of the tailpipe. And so what happens is it just sits there and it cools down. Well, as it cools down, there is water in it in the vapor phase, and that water liquefies out and, or I should say condenses out, and goes into the liquid phase and just sits in the tailpipe. That's why tailpipes are going to rust out pretty much no matter what you do, right? Because there, it's a high temperature environment where bare metal is exposed to both water and oxygen, which the water seems to act like a catalyst and cause rust to uh, begin uh, sooner than it would normally. Um, but that, that is actual water in the tailpipe, and it just comes from the gasoline. It's not like the water is dissolved in the gasoline. That's not the case. The gasoline has to be burned to produce the water. So that's the difference. That's one place. Another place, if you uh, look at the heating system in your residence, the, if you burn natural gas or propane for your heat, you can look at the stack coming off of the furnace. And if that stack looks like what I've got on the left-hand side, a, a metal stack, you know that you're using the lower heating value of the fuel. What that really means is that you're not getting quite as much energy out of the fuel that you're paying the gas company for. 
Okay, the reason that you use a metal stack in this case is because the combustion products still have significant thermal energy in them. In other words, they're hot. Okay, what you let, let me warn you as an aside real quick. I'm going to change your vocabulary in this class. What you usually refer to as heat, eh, we can't quite do that anymore. Okay, if you walk into a room and you say, boy, it sure is hot in here, you're not speaking thermodynamically, okay? What I'd like you to do is when you walk into a room and the temperature's high, say, wow, there's an excess concentration of thermal energy in this room. That's more precise. Later on, we're going to find that heat is actually a transfer due to temperature differences. But uh, I'll say that several times as we go, so let's move on. So if the exhaust gases have excess thermal energy in them, they're at too high a temperature for any other material. You need metal. If, so that it won't melt, right? So that it won't degrade. Now, one problem with this this metal chimney, if the temperature of the exhaust gases goes down too far, well then the water that's in the vapor phase can actually condense out, can deposit on the inside surface of these metal chimneys and cause rusting. That can be a real problem. As a matter of fact, nowadays we have very high efficiency uh, furnaces that burn either natural gas or propane and be careful with that. You have to use the right orifice for the right fuel. The nature of those two fuels is very diff different, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and you'll notice that these high efficiency furnaces have PVC pipe as their chimney. You might look at that and say, boy, that seems ridiculous, right? You're burning a fuel, you know it gets hot. How on earth can we take the ex these exhaust gases out of a PVC pipe? Well, the reason is because these units are so efficient in their heat exchange that they, they extract so much thermal energy, what you would have called heat before this course, from the exhaust gas stream that the water starts to condense out. And if you had a metal pipe, number one, you wouldn't need it because the temperature is not high enough to require it. But number two, the water would be condensing out and would rust through that pipe very quickly and cause an unsafe situation. So it's kind of interesting. You can go look in whatever building you're in now. If you can access the furnace, look at it and see what kind of chimney it has coming out of it. If it's plastic, you know that you have a very high efficiency furnace and you'll be paying less for fuel, which is a good thing. I really like this animated uh, picture that I found because it illustrates thermal energy very visually. So it's, you can see it moving around there. Um, there are really three different primary forms of thermal or internal energy. Technically there's a difference between the two. If you read the text you'll notice that the author is careful in distinguishing the two. Internal energy really is thermal energy plus chemical energy added together. I will tend to make the mistake of using the two terms interchangeably. Most of the time what we're really interested in, in, in is the thermal energy, which is the, the motion of the molecules on the molecular scale. But there are three fundamental different modes, if you will, uh, that can store thermal energy. There's translation of the molecule. In other words, as the molecule is zipping around through space, that motion is kinetic energy on the molecular scale and that contributes to thermal energy. Another uh, con contribution is from rotation of the molecule, okay? So that's another mode. Uh, and then finally, vibration within the molecule's structure is another mode uh, where thermal energy can be stored. I've got a, another image of an animated molecule. I can't remember what this is. Um, the large gray spheres are supposed to represent carbon atoms. I can't remember what the red and I think the red is oxygen. The very small ones are hydrogen, and the blue ones, I think, are nitrogen. But this is probably a, 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 um, a structure of some medicine or something I found online. But what I really thought was interesting about this is you can see this molecule, and if you ever look at a molecular structure, it's drawn out and it's just still on the page. But really, on the molecular scale, the more internal energy or the more thermal energy that these molecules have, the more they're moving, the more they're, they're vibrating, around, or vibrating around and uh, the more energy they contain. So I just thought that was a good uh, graphic. Now, if you look at this, you might try to think of what modes are we not observing here, right? Vibration is certainly there. You can see vibration throughout this molecule. Rotation, well, the, the molecule doesn't have any bulk rotation, so that wouldn't be there. And also, it's not flying around on our screen. Apparently, it's not moving in space. So really, the only mode of, of uh, thermal energy storage being shown here in the molecule is vibration. So a large portion of thermodynamics is, okay, once we take a fuel and we burn it, now the molecules are zipping around like crazy. How do we use those? And here's, here's one idea. 
what if we had water and this this water of course has thermal energy because it's above a temperature of absolute zero so the water has to be moving to some extent what if we put a uh, paddle wheel in this water and at some point in time there should be a water molecule that's going to bounce off of one of the blades of the paddle wheel right won't that turn the paddle wheel and give us some energy well the problem with that is that there's an equal probability that a water molecule will bounce off the other side and prevent the rotation in the direction that you desire so since water molecules are so small there's a, a tremendous amount of them impacting or touching and bouncing off of this paddle wheel on the molecular scale so it's all very disorganized and the net effect is nothing well that's not really quite true actually you know from experience that if you were to take a paddle wheel and let's say that it's really hot and you dip it into the water what will happen it'll cool down won't it why does it cool down well it cools down because as uh, you know what it's doing is the the say imagine you zoom in on, on one of the blades the paddle wheel is moving like crazy on the molecular scale and when a water molecule comes next to it it gets pushed so that's literally a transfer of thermal energy from the paddle wheel to the water and what will happen is the water and the paddle wheel will equilibrate in temperature they'll come to an equilibrium so actually there is an effect this does actually happen it's just there's so many molecules in contact with the paddle wheel you can't get a net rotation out of the paddle wheel so the question becomes how do we take all this disorganized energy and somehow channel it and so you see a channel that we've made here so that the the water is now moving all in one direction and now it can push a, a paddle wheel but this is the reason that we can never extract all 100 percent of the thermal energy and convert it into work or think of it as motion for the time being it's because those water molecules in this case have to keep going to get out of the way or in a steam powered turbine the steam has to keep going plus the steam has to have a temperature above absolute zero right the turbine is not going to extract all the thermal energy from the steam and that that energy that the steam still has is basically waste and there's not a thing in the world we can do about it we'll put more math around that a little bit later with the second law of thermo but for right now it's enough to know that we'd really like to extract as much thermal energy as possible think about it if you could make a car and you could advertise honestly that it got 200 miles per gallon you'd be rich right I mean everyone wants to get more energy out of or more use out of the the chemical energy that they're paying for right I love it I drive an old beater car because it gets 50 miles per gallon you know so to me it's worth it I want to get that higher efficiency so uh, this is a topic that has been very well studied it unfortunately is a topic that is not well known in public um, I mean there's plenty of people that know about it but you have to study it to understand it and so there's unfortunately I think a lot of conspiracy theories that surround energy saying oh big oil doesn't want us to get you know higher economy uh, uh, in our cars because then they wouldn't sell as much oil well that's that's ridiculous oil is used for all sorts of things it's used for making drugs it's feedstock chemicals all sorts of things I think big oil would be very happy selling a barrel of oil for a thousand dollars rather than the fifty dollars today right and so if all of our cars could get much better fuel economy they wouldn't care that they don't have to extract more oil from the ground that's fine that means fewer drilling regs fewer dry oil uh, uh, dry wells to pay for uh, this would be great but there is a fundamental limit there's only so much energy in things and that's one of the things I really want you to get out of this course if you think about a barrel of, in, of, um, of oil there's only so much chemical energy in that barrel you can't just keep extracting more and more there are members of my family that don't understand this uh, my father's a great guy but there's a lot of things he doesn't know I wish he had studied engineering because he's a, a great brain for it but I've given up trying to explain some of these things to him for example there's only so much energy in say one square meter when the Sun is shining on it right you know a lot of people say well why don't we just go solar couldn't we just make our solar cells get better and better and better well it is true that solar cells are getting better that is absolutely true but there is still a limit there is still only so much energy per square meter and if you want more energy than that you're gonna have to have more square meters to collect it so we'll, we'll go into some of these topics a little bit more as we go along there is an interesting video I'd like you to watch it's one where um, I don't require it but it's a uh, mechanical storage kind of a mechanical battery and they use a flywheel 
meant to mention it earlier, but it's something that was tried, I think, back in the 60s, and they had built several buses with these things, and they would charge up these mechanical batteries, basically a flock wheel with a large amount of inertia, to fairly high speeds, uh, so that then those flywheels could be used for traction uh, on the bus, for driving the bus. It was really interesting. I'd like you to look at that because it's another way of storing energy besides the chemical energy in a battery or the chemical energy in gasoline or diesel. Now that we've discovered all the forms of energy that a system can have, the sum of all those energies is the total system energy. So. We've discovered thermal energy. You knew about potential and kinetic energy, likely. There are also things like mechanical energy. If you have a compressed spring or a, a hydraulic accumulator, which includes a spring inside of it, those are forms of mechanical energy that are not really potential energy. Yeah, sometimes we talk about the potential energy of a spring, but it's more appropriately called mechanical energy. And, of course, it's different from kinetic and potential energy. There can be electrical energy, magnetic. Uh, chemical and nuclear. Of course, we mentioned chemical energy, talking about the fuel you use in your car every day or the fuel you put in your body, right, the food you eat. Uh, nuclear energy is also a, a real thing. I've included a couple of videos that show how uranium is mined if you're interested. But all of these together are summed up to the system energy. Now, most of the time in this class, even though we use chemical energy, we'll we'll really not use it a lot in the class, okay? So we might just say we've got a certain amount of thermal energy, of course, it was burn, or generated by burning gasoline or diesel in the engine, or even external combustion, say coal or something in a turbine power plant. Um, but most of the time we won't use the heating values. Now we will a little bit. We will use the heating value, so you need to remember that, but most of the time I'll just give you the heating value for whatever fuel we're using. Uh, by the way, Speaking of energy, did you know that gasoline and diesel are not the only thing that can push your car down the road? Wood can also. In fact, I do have a video that I've included that I require you watch where some guys, I don't know what country they're in, some European country, they converted a car to run on wood. Now this may seem strange, but what you really do is you partially combust the wood to generate wood gas. And then that wood gas is what burns in the cylinder. So uh, you'll watch that a little bit later. Basically, the forms of energy we're primarily going to work with in this class are the top four there. Thermal, potential, kinetic, and mechanical energies. Now, I've included this graphic of a pig flying just because it's humorous, but it also, I realized, includes all of the forms of energy, or potentially could. Some of them are a stretch. You see some springs as the legs that would represent mechanical energy. I've tried to illustrate it in a cartoon way, showing that it's moving, so there's kinetic energy. If it's on a, a wire rope, it may still have some potential energy. If it's above a temperature of absolute zero, it's got thermal energy. Now, it's, of course, made from an old propane tank. So if it still has some propane inside of it, there's certainly chemical energy in it as well. And, of course, it's a stretch, but we could talk about it moving through a magnetic field or an electrical field so that it has magnetic energy. I'm getting into uh, topics out of my depth. Uh, we could pretend there's some nuclear isotope in it, but the idea here is that a system's total energy is all of the energy in that system. And as I said, those are the top four uh, there in the list that we will deal with in this class.